share my screen. All right. You should see WHS Astronomy Club, the sky this month, December 2020. All right, well, today's the full moon. It was actually this morning at 4.30 a.m. You know, the full moon actually is only a moment uh, from an astronomical perspective, but the moon looks full for two or three days. And it's with a full beaver moon. We learned about that last month because it fell in November, which had two. Uh, no, that was October that had two full moons. And this one just snuck into the last day of November. So full moon, get out tonight and observe it if you can. I did quite a bit the last couple of days. Uh, the weather today is mostly cloudy, but it looks like we're going to have quite a few clear days in the next week or week and a half, which is great because just after the full moon is a great time to look at the night sky. In December, it's called the cold moon, the full cold moon, according to the old Palmer's Almanac. I think that's a good name. The last quarter is in a week, December 7th, and the new moon is December 14th, the best time to do astronomy with telescopes. And then, of course, the first quarter on December 21st, a very special date. We'll talk about December 21st in a minute. And then the full moon, the full cold moon is December 29th, just to lead us into the new year. There's the uh, big picture of what the moon looks like for the next month. So yeah, the moon looks full for two or three days, two or three days. And it's mostly gone for two or three days. But the truth is, it's constantly changing second by second. All right, on to the, uh, the sun. So that was a picture taken today, today by the Solar Dynamic Observatory, which is a telescope in space that NASA operates. And it's a very particular picture of the sun that shows um, the activity of the sun. And you might remember last month, the sun was pretty quiet. It's got two big storms going on here. Those are magnetic storms. And over here, we can see the corona has some flares in it as well. So it looks like the sun is getting more active. Now, I promised to talk a little bit about December 21st. As we know from middle school, the, sun, the Earth is tilted on its axis about 21 and a half degrees. And um, it orbits the sun, of course. And there's one day of the year right here when the tilt uh, I said 21 and a half, it's 23 and a half degrees, I misspoke. Um, the tilt is at its maximum away from the sun, meaning the northern hemisphere is tilted as much as possible as it can ever get away from the sun. That's called the winter solstice. Uh, the reason it's called solstice, that word translates as the sun stands still. And as a kid, that always confused me because the sun doesn't stand still ever. But if you were to watch the arc of the sun across the sky, as ancient people did because they weren't in buildings all the time and there wasn't light pollution, the sun makes an arc from east to west every day. And as it gets closer to winter, that arc gets lower and lower in the sky. And it's not the sun that stands still, it's the daily arc of the sun that stands still. Every day for the last six months, that arc has been getting lower and lower and lower. But December 21st and 22nd, it will stop getting lower and turn around and get higher. And that's the origin of the word winter solstice. Now it's the winter solstice, just like the full moon is not a couple of days, it's a moment. Uh, I have it written pretty soon what moment it is this year. Um, but what it means is it's the longest night of the year for us. And of course, then the next astronomical holiday is the vernal equinox, the spring equinox on March 21st or 22nd. And that's where the axis of the Earth is parallel to its orbit. The summer solstice is when the axis is tilting most toward the sun. And the autumnal equinox, September 22nd to 23rd, is when the axis is parallel again, but we're going to colder weather instead of warmer. This year, the winter solstice is Monday, December 21st at 2.20 a.m. PST. I'm going to teach you, unless one of you wants to teach you, more about the winter solstice next time. And in fact, I noticed as a young boy um, growing up in a uh, Catholic Christian household that we celebrated Christmas. And I noticed because I loved astronomy and between you and me, I didn't really like going to church that much, but I had to because it was one of the rules of the house. But I did notice that um, Christmas was awfully close to the winter solstice. And uh, I asked around and I said, hey, hey, 
Is that because winter is really cold and dark, particularly before we had easy heat and light, and that people needed a party? And of course, I was told that that was blasphemous and I should go probably pray and feel better about my faith. And of course, of course, even devout Christians uh, of all faiths now recognize whether or not you believe in Jesus, they do, that Jesus wasn't born in the winter. Um, that the holiday was moved to near the winter solstice because there were pre-existing pre-Christian holidays. And some of you may know that there are Jewish holidays, a holiday, Hanukkah, which is near the solstice. And maybe some of you are from other faiths who know of other holidays that are near the winter solstice. I have been told, this is not a fact, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a statement that I'd like to research, but I've been told by people who seemed wise that every, every, uh, every religion, every culture outside the tropics has a major holiday around the solstice. I'd like to investigate that. If you know of any religious holidays around the solstice from any faith, yours or any other, bring it next time because we're going to talk about that. Oh, now here is a great graph. I showed this to you last time. Um, this is a graph of the daylight versus night. Um, my screen just went weird. Did it go weird for you guys? Give me just a second. I'm not sure what happened. Okay, I feel better now. Um, man, my computer's misbehaving. Hang on. Have any of you had any technology problems in the last few months of of uh, distance learning oh, every day. All right, here it is back again. Do you see this line over here? That is December 21st. That's the shortest day of the year. You can look down here at this data and we have 11 hours and 42 minutes of night on that day and eight hours and 42 minutes of light. Now you might notice if you're clever, that does not add up to 24. That's because we have this stuff called twilight. And um, most people just think there's twilight between dark and light, between light and dark. But actually there's three different twilights. There is civil twilight. So this, this color of blue is daylight. This is civil twilight. That's what everybody thinks of as twilight, right after the sun goes down or right before it comes up. But there's also nautical twilight, which was defined by mariners over the years and is used by airplanes as well. That's where it's darker. Okay, it's getting dark, but it's not totally dark yet. And then this one right here is astronomical twilight because astronomers really like it to be totally dark. There's no sunlight lighting up the sky at all, even reflected sunlight. So we have night, astronomical twilight, nautical twilight, civil twilight, day, and then reverse. So yeah, you got to keep warm. You got to eat uh, good comfort foods and eggnog and whatever else to... Uh, I just made those numbers bigger in case I couldn't read them. All right, we're still talking about the sun. Here is a graph of sunspots from 1750 to the present. And you can see that the sun has a periodicity of sunspots, although there in the 1800s, it disappeared mostly for a while. And this last little blue part here is enlarged here. We had a minimum of sunspots about 2008, a maximum around 2014, and a minimum around 2020. For most of the last year, we haven't had any sunspots, but look what's happening here. We're starting to get sunspots again. Up here in about 2025 or so, we're going to the next solar maximum. And what do you know? This was a picture taken today. Indeed, again, from the Solar Dynamic Observatory. What are these black dots? They are sunspots. Here's the Earth for reference, and there's Jupiter. So there's some little tiny sunspots, smaller than the Earth here. There's one that's Earth-sized or a little bigger right there. And then there's a giant sunspot. Well, maybe not a giant, but a very large. It's way bigger than the Earth, but not as big as Jupiter. So I think we would probably call this three sunspot clusters right now. We're starting to have more sunspots. Very cool. As a future activity, I want to teach you all how to, um, how to look at the sun safely. All right, let's talk about the planets. Uh, this is the same graph we looked at last time. 
Uh, Mercury, you can't see in December. It's too close to the sun. Venus is very easy to see out in the morning. Got to get up before dawn. Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are all super easy to see. They're up from the time it gets dark around dinner time, and they're up until you go to bed. They're not up all night, but they're up a lot. Uh, Uranus and Neptune are also up, but of course you need a telescope to see those. Mars is just about as bright as it ever gets. Oh, in fact, here's some fun things. These are things I want you to do. I want you to mark these on your calendar. Okay, that's an advantage of having our website where I can put this, post this up, or Sarah can. On December 10th, if you're willing to get up 90 minutes before sunrise, you will see the waning crescent moon and Spica, a bright star, and maybe if you're lucky, Venus. We call that a conjunction when two astronomical objects are right by each other in the sky, and they're very beautiful. So there's one conjunction for December in about uh, 10 days. And then this one, you don't have to get up early. This is an hour, oh yes, you do. Still, this one is, we'll get up before sunrise, an hour before sunrise on December 11th. The 12th is the best or the 13th. Venus will be right next to that waning crescent moon. These are the ones where you don't have to get up early. This is after sunset, a perfect time of day. On December uh, 16th and 17th, you'll have the waxing crescent moon and Saturn and Jupiter. Saturn and Jupiter are gonna be closer to each other, and they're not actually closer to each other, they're gonna appear closer to each other, than they've been in hundreds and hundreds of years. This is a very exciting conjunction and the moon's gonna zip right past them. So we'll have to make a note to get outside and look at those after sunset on the 16th or 17th. And just a week later, um, December 22nd through 24th, the nearly full waxing moon is going to pass right past Mars with the closest conjunction on December 23rd. Now, these conjunctions, I think, are very beautiful. They're beautiful in the naked eye, but they're super beautiful in binoculars. Super beautiful. Now, I have 30 pair of binoculars. If any of you want to borrow a pair of binoculars for the year, all you have to do is send me an email and we'll work it out, okay? Um, your family may have binoculars, but if not, they're just gathering dust. I'd love to loan you binoculars. I do a lot of naked eye and binocular observing. Probably more, no, not probably, definitely more than I do with um, the telescope. All right, the constellation of the month. So we've decided we're going to highlight one constellation each month. This month, it's Pegasus. Here is a professional star chart. You can see the constellations are like maps of counties. This is Pegasus. It's near Aquarius, Pisces, Andromeda, Lacerta, Cygnus. Oh, Cygnus, we've heard about that today. Volpecula, Delphinus, and Equileus. Okay, there's 88 constellations. Pegasus is actually the largest constellation in the Northern Hemisphere and the seventh largest in the world. A lot of those Southern constellations are pretty big. You can already kind of see, remember the difference between constellations and asterisms? This is supposed to be a winged horse. Pegasus means winged horse. Does it look like a winged horse to you? I don't know. To me, it looks like a square. And the asterism is called the great square of Pegasus. Now, this is an artist drawing of just the 14 brightest stars. And uh, that makes it a little easier, okay, a little easier to see. There's the square, and then there's two things over here that maybe could be legs, and something over here that maybe could be a head. Uh, the one right there is because that's a deep sky object, not a star. We'll talk about it another day. And there is an artist's drawing of the winged horse. Well, partly it's upside down because the mythology came from another part of the world, much further south than us. And they um, saw it right side up at least part of the year. I still don't think it looks like a winged horse, but at least you now know where it came from. So I already told you a lot of this. It belongs to the Perseus family of constellations. Uh, it can, contains a Messier object. We'll, we'll talk about Messier objects. Those are interesting objects um, cataloged by Charles Messier a couple hundred years ago. It has nine stars with confirmed exoplanets. And I believe in our next student presentation, we're going to learn about exoplanets. The brightest star in the constellation is Enif. Now, the stars are named um, their... Greek name, Pegasi, with the ending I, and then in principle, in order of the Greek alphabet. So this one should be the fifth brightest star, 
That's why I said in principle, it's actually the brightest star. Really alpha Pegasi should be the brightest, but for historical reasons, it's epsilon, which is the fifth letter of the Greek alphabet. But some stars, the brightest stars have common names. Enif, I don't know how to pronounce it. Enif, I don't know. It has a magnitude of 2.4. And uh, if you know your magnitude scales, that's bright enough to see, but it's not a super bright star. There is a meteor shower associated with Pegasus in July, the Pegasids. And of course, as I already told you, it's known as the home of the great square. And this is what I really want you to see between now and next time. If you go outside and look south on any December evening uh, around 7 p.m., about two thirds of the way from the horizon to the zenith, so look at the horizon straight out flat, the zenith is straight overhead and go about two thirds of the way up, you will see four stars that form. And at this time of year, I call it the baseball diamond constellation, home base, First, second, third, okay? Here's the first base coach over here. Here's the third base coach. I don't know. I'm not sure what center field is doing here, okay? All right, you can see it right there. I want you to go outside and see if you can see the great square of Pegasus. Uh, a little mythology. In Greek mythology, Pegasus is a white winged horse that sprang for the neck of Medusa when Perseus beheaded her. So Medusa was this beautiful young woman uh, and she was turned into a monster by the goddess Athena after being caught, being defiled by the sea god Poseidon in the goddess's temple. You know, a, I have to say a lot of these old mythologies are just horribly sexist. Yeah, so um, yeah, she was probably being attacked or raped by the sea god. And of course, so she gets punished, right? Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Yeah, we need to rewrite these myths to be a little more in tune with modern values. Uh, so anyway, then Medusa uh, got turned into this, this monster and uh, Athena turned Medusa's hair into snakes and made her face so ugly that anyone who looked at her immediately turned to stone. You, you've probably heard that story. Okay, so uh, Perseus was sent to kill Medusa by the king Polydectes of Seraphus, who was the brother of Dictus, the man who took Perseus and his mother Danae in and raised Perseus his own son. Polydectus wanted Danae for himself. Of course, it's always about some creepy guy wanting the woman for himself. And Perseus stood in his way because he wanted to defend his mother from the king's advances, you know, read assault, okay. Uh, so, you know, the king sent Perseus off, expecting Perseus to be killed, okay? He, he liked that. He wanted the son to get out of his way so he could have his way with the mom. But when Perseus killed Medusa, um, Pegasus and the warrior Chryseor sprang from her neck, both of them offspring of the sea god Poseidon. Now, why? I don't know, but that happened. And uh, Perseus survived. There's more to the myth, but that's the teaser I'm going to give you so far. Now, the name Pegasus is derived from the Greek pegai, which means springs or water, and Chris, a sword's name, means the golden sword. Okay, so when he was born, Pegasus flew away to Mount Helicon in Boeotia, where the muses lived, and he befriended them. He created a spring, you know, where water pools up out of the ground that was named Hippocrene by striking the ground with his hoof. The name Hippocrene means the horse's fountain. And it was said that those who drank from the spring were blessed with the gift to write poetry. All right, well, hopefully they'll write some poetry that uh, is more appealing to me than the mythology. So let's get back to science. We got a star of the month, Anif, the brightest star in Pegasus. And there, there it is, there's a picture of it taken with a high powered telescope. You can see its color. Let's learn a little bit about it. It's an orange super giant star. And it's in the muzzle of the mythical winged horse, okay? It's not part of the square, great square of Pegasus. See if you can find it. Okay, I'll post this on the website as soon as we get that going and you can find uh, NF and see if you can find it. You can find it, it's the brightest star, 2.4 magnitude. It's about 690 light years from Earth. Well, that means it's really a bright star if it's that bright, apparently. Uh, it's a uh, stellar classification is K2. That means it's a super giant. Okay, and supergiants, uh, supergiant stars are interesting. It's like 12 times more massive than the sun and 185 times its radius. So if you placed NF at the center of the solar system, it would go all the way out 
to Mercury and absorb Mercury and all the way out to Venus and absorb Venus and not quite make it to Earth. Okay, that's on big honking star. Uh, it's a cold star though. Uh, our, uh, our star, our sun is 5,800 Kelvin. It's only 4,300 or 400 Kelvin, but it's like 4,000 times more luminous. Wow, it is super, super bright. Uh, it has a projected rotational velocity of eight kilometers per second, which is really fast. And this is what I find most interesting about it. Its estimated age is about 20 million years. Do you know how old our sun is? 4.5 billion years. Our sun is about halfway through its life, going to be lived about 9 billion years. This star is 20 million years old, but it's not going to live that long. Okay. Stars this massive and this luminous have very short lives. And we think it's going to die soon, like in the next 5 million years or so. And it might be massive enough to be a supernova, meaning it would explode in a massive explosion. But it, we don't know that. It also could end its life as a white dwarf, okay? White dwarfs um, don't explode. They do shed off their outer layers and become a small compact white dwarf. We just don't know enough physics yet to know if it's going to be a supernova or a white dwarf. We need more projects like Nolan and Souls so we can figure out how stars really work. Uh, what do you know? It's a variable star. What do you know? Its brightness varies from a magnitude of 0.7 to 3.5, but it varies over extremely long time frames. So you probably won't see those. It does occasionally though have instantaneous almost changes in brightness. In 1972, it appeared as bright as Altair, which is like brighter than magnitude one, and it faded again in 20 minutes. It's called a super flare. They're extremely rare and nobody understands it. Okay, So you could make your mark in astrophysics by figuring out why. There are super flares in some stars. I think I had that one twice. All right, and our final slide. Um, if you want to take some pictures, astro imaging, hopefully in the new year, we're going to have Maxwell give us a lesson on how to do this. But most of these I already told you about. Conjunctions are super great things to photograph. All you need is a digital SLR and a tripod. Don't forget your tripod. Um, and just mess with it. Uh, on the 10th, we've got the conjunction of the moon and Spica, the 12th the moon and Venus. We do have the Geminid uh, meteor shower on the 13th and 14th and the Ursids on the, uh, I think that's a typo, 21st, 22nd. So if you have any time on your hands and you can get away from the city, I usually don't bother to watch meteor showers in the city. You, know, you don't want a telescope. You don't even want binoculars. You want to bundle up and get some hot cocoa and lay on your back and watch the meteor showers. We already talked about the new and full moon and the conjunction of the moon and Mars. So that is your Guy this month for the month of December. I am excited to see what Violet will come up with next month. Okay, so like Minato said, if anybody wants to, winter solstice is coming up, and if anybody does want to do any kind of presentation or project relating to winter holidays and how they align astronomically, I think Lee said something about 